Good afternoon, folks. Evan Donovan, political anchor for Nexstar. You've been watching the Nexstar live impeachment hearing digital broadcast from Capitol Hill. I am joined here on your screen, as you can see, across me to, from me. To my left is Jesse Tenur. In the bottom left-hand corner there, digital anchor J.B. Buno. You have been watching the final day of testimony in the second week of these impeachment hearings from the House Committee of Intelligence on Capitol Hill. You saw there Chairman Adam Schiff right at the end shedding some tears or at least getting a little emotional, emotional right for there sure. emotional uh, for sure. about, uh, about what he views as the big problem with this impeachment inquiry and, and why he thinks the president uh, may deserve to get impeached. We shall see whether or not his committee uh, or, in, in fact, the Judiciary Committee will draw up articles of impeachment to send over to the Senate. Before we go into some of the sound bites that uh, we want to review from this afternoon of testimony, I want to get over to uh, Jesse Turner. And before we even do that, let me just talk about a few programming notes here. We're going to wrap up what you saw here on Capitol Hill as you're watching the uh, House Committee on Intelligence Room clear out here. We're going to wrap up what we heard here. And then there, there are no more hearings scheduled for this week. The House is on a break next week. So there are all the members are home for Thanksgiving, and then there are only two weeks left when we come back into December. And that's what you heard there in some of those closing statements, that it's unclear, really. You, you heard the ranking member, Devin Nunes, say it's unclear, really, where this is going to go from here. And uh, I'll pass it over to my D.C. Bureau correspondent and colleague, Jesse Turner. Jesse, we really don't know where it goes from here. Yeah, you're right. We kind of thought that um, Schiff would at least maybe enlighten all of us a little bit on that. But um, Speaker Pelosi was asked the same thing just moments ago, and she said maybe some testimony leads to the need for another. And so they, they haven't yet ruled out having other hearings. I'm not sure how likely that would be dealing with the timeline that you just um kind of spelled out for us, um, but she said that they're just going to let the facts take them where they need to go next. Um, as far as how this moves, the Judiciary Committee would take over and um, see what articles of impeachment, if any, they would start putting together. But yeah, we're not sure when all of that would happen. And Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's so, and, and you heard Devin Nunes, the ranking member on the Republican side, sort of allude to this, that this, you know, he said multiple times this week, this used to be the Intelligence Committee, it's acting as the Impeachment Committee. Mm -hmm. So this is the House, per, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, or the Intelligence Committee, as it's kind of referred to. If they decide, House Democrats decide that they want to draw up impeachment articles, that would be done by the Judiciary Committee, Correct. Exactly. That's correct, which would sideline everything else that House Judiciary is working on right now. We saw something huge happen this week with them. There are other things happening here in Washington besides the impeachment inquiry hearings. Um, they actually passed along some marijuana legislation that's pretty landmark. And so a lot of that work would just be sidelined until they figured out all of this impeachment inquiry um, data gathering that was happening over these past two weeks and what to do with it. Yeah. And just as a reminder, folks, impeachment of the president, if the, the House decides that they want to impeach the president, they would draw up articles of impeachment, delineating what they felt were the crime, high crimes and misdemeanors uh, that the president was responsible for breaking. Then that would be voted on by the full House. And this is why people decry this process as being largely political, because if you do hold the majority in this chamber of Congress, you could draw up articles of impeachment as long as you can get the members to vote on it, then you could impeach a president. But remember, impeachment doesn't mean removal. So for our people are viewing at home, Jesse, tell everybody what happens if they decide to draw up these articles of impeachment and vote on them. They would likely pass because the House is primarily Democrat and then it would go to the Senate. Mm -hmm. You're right, and that's what everybody in Washington has been saying. You know, we're not exactly sure what these articles of impeachment could look like. There could be several of them that the House votes on, but everybody's pretty sure the House has come this far. The Democrats who have been controlling this process aren't going to just drop it. Um, so it's likely there will be a vote. It's likely the House does send this for then a trial in the Senate. And that is... Um, 
a six day of the week affair. Essentially, every senator is expected to be in his or her chair in the Senate chamber to go through this trial and listen to all of this. And it's it's for the public as well. So the public would be able to tune in. But um, that's why the Senate, in a way, is kind of gearing up and seeing, you know, this this really derails anything they're trying to do as well if the articles of, impe of impeachment does make it to their chamber for a trial. And then they would have to move forward and decide whether to convict the president, which right now, as far as it's looking, um, they probably wouldn't have the votes. But yeah. things can change. Sure. And keep in mind, obviously, that to remove a president by the Senate, they need a two thirds vote. So you would need a number of Republican members to cross the aisle and vote with their Democratic members. And don't forget, Democrats in the Senate represent an entire state. The, the political calculus is a little bit more tricky there. So you'd have to, first of all, count on all Democrats voting to to remove the president, all Democrats in the Senate voting to remove him. And then you'd have to have Mm, a, a good number of Republicans. What am I? What number am I looking at, Jesse? Twenty. About twenty Republicans would have to cross the aisle uh, and vote for impeachment, and I, we just don't see that happening. Obviously, unless there's some bombshell testimony. And this is. Let me just read a tweet from Chad Pergram, who is a, a Fox News reporter sort of echoing exactly what we just said. The last of all announced public impeachment hearings is adjourned. Intelligence Committee could announce additional hearings, although nothing is expected next week. The committee could also begin working on its report to send to the judiciary. Uh, so, again, that's that's what we think is, is coming up next. Uh, the, I want to play for you a couple of sound bites here, folks, uh, that, that we thought were impactful from this afternoon's testimony. Uh, the first one I think that we want to get to is... Uh, David Holmes, who, uh, again, Holmes is an aide to Ambassador uh, Bill Taylor. And Holmes was talking about, uh, about Gordon Sondland, who is the EU, or the U.S. ambassador to the EU. Holmes is talking about Sondland's views after this phone call at the restaurant in Kiev in the Ukraine. Sondland was talking to Trump. He's sort of holding the phone away from his ear, allegedly, according, according to the testimony from Holmes and Sondland because the, the president was loud. Uh, we know this, the president speaks loudly. And Holmes heard him say, uh, heard the president ask about investigations and whether uh, Zelensky was going to do these investigations, the Ukrainian president. And Sondland said he would. He said he loves your ass and, and he would do anything for you uh, or do anything you want, I think was the language that he used. And then Holmes asks Sondland after the phone call is over what the president actually thinks about Ukraine. And this is what he said. I then took the opportunity to ask Ambassador Sondland for his candid impression of the president's views on Ukraine. In particular, I asked Ambassador Sondland if it was true that the president did not give a expletive about Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland agreed that the president did not give an expletive about Ukraine. I asked why not. And Ambassador Sondland stated that the president only cares about big stuff. I noted there's big stuff going on in Ukraine, like, like go Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the president, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. The conversation then moved on to other topics. David Holmes right there explaining what Democrats say is the big issue here is that the that the president wasn't interested in fighting corruption in Ukraine, that this was specifically targeted at something of value to him personally, that their argument is that he really didn't care about Ukraine, that basically he just cared about, quote unquote, the big stuff, which would be an announcement publicly of investigations into his political rival, Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. Uh, I also want to get to, uh, to our, our second soundbite here. Uh, that I thought was impactful from this afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Fiona Hill. Uh, Fiona uh, used to sit on the National Security Council. She's an expert on uh, Ukrainian and Russian and Eurasian affairs. Uh, Hill is talking about the disinformation campaign that Russia ran against the United States in the United States during the 2016 campaign and what they tried to do to delegitimize the president, whoever the president might be. We heard that from her testimony earlier that she was try that that the, that Russia was trying to uh, was clearly in the in the tank for President Trump because they thought it would be uh, better for them if President Trump won, but that they were also trying to just sow general discord and really were trying to delegitimize whoever would end up winning and becoming president. And this is why Dr. Fiona Hill, an expert on Russia and Eurasian affairs, says that is so dangerous to America, not just 
uh, back then in 2016, but continuing and as we move into the election year in 2020. Right now, Russia's security services and their proxies have geared up to repeat their interference in the 2020 election. We are running out of time to stop them. In the course of this investigation, I would ask that you please not promote politically driven falsehoods that so clearly advance Russian interests. As Republicans and Democrats have agreed for decades, Ukraine is a valued partner of the United States, and it plays an important role in our national security. And as I told the committee last month, I refuse to be part of an effort to legitimize an alternate narrative that the Ukrainian government is a US adversary and that Ukraine, not Russia, attacked us in 2016. These fictions are harmful even if they're deployed for purely domestic political purposes. President Putin and the Russian security services operate like a super PAC. They deploy millions of dollars to weaponize our own political opposition research and false narratives. When we are consumed by partisan rancor, we cannot combat these external forces as they, as they seek to divide us against each other, degrade our institutions and destroy the faith of the American people in our democracy. I respect the work that this Congress does in carrying out its constitutional responsibilities, including this requiry, and I'm here to help you to the best of my ability. If the President or anyone else impedes or subverts the national security of the United States in order to further domestic political or personal interests, that's more than worthy of your attention. But we must not let domestic politics stop us from defending ourselves against the foreign powers who truly wish us harm. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. That was the end there of Dr. Fiona Hill's opening statement that she gave before she started her testimony there. And again, she is testifying to the fact that the disinformation campaign, that Ukraine had some sort of coordinated effort to interfere in the United States elections, that it was proposed by Russians, that it was propagated by Russians, and that when Americans latch on to that, as the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, did along with, along with some help from bad acting Ukrainian officials and also some people in America, that it undermines our national security because effectively we're playing into Russia's hands, uh, the point that she was making right there. Uh, we do have an interactive poll going on. I'll toss it over to JB to tell you more about that. Yeah, hey guys, now that we have week two of the impeachment hearings in the books, obviously really curious how the American public is feeling out there, especially our viewers, if you're watching us and have been watching us over the last week and a half, Hello there to you. We would love to hear your perspective. We are running an interactive poll through the power of Facebook Live. It will be popping up on your device if it hasn't already. I'm not exactly sure how Facebook determines who gets that interactive poll, but Evan, check back in in a few minutes and we will have the results here for you. I already see the numbers bouncing. And they're interesting. I'll well, just good. leave it at that. They are certainly interesting, to say the least. Good. Yeah, look for that icon on your screen if you're joining us through Facebook. If you're not and you're joining us through the website, thank you so much for being here. Again, you are watching Nextstar's live digital broadcast of the impeachment hearings of President Donald Trump. I'm joined by Jesse Tunur, our D.C. bureau correspondent. I am Evan Donovan, political anchor for Nextstar. I wanted to just t play one more soundbite and then get your reaction to some of these, Jesse. Uh, Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio has uh, been, a, been a fierce advocate for the president uh, and a fierce defender of the Republican position throughout these impeachment hearings. He and David Holmes got into a little bit of a tussle uh, back and forth where he, he was sort of interrupting David and then David was interrupting him. Uh, I want to play for you that exchange. Basically, David Holmes is trying to answer Jordan's question about what Ambassador Taylor knew about the phone call that Holmes overheard with Sondland in that restaurant. And here's that exchange. And at the time, the main takeaway from the call was the president doesn't care about Ukraine. So we're going to have a tough road ahead to convince him that it's important enough for him to schedule an Oval Office for President Zelensky and ultimately to release this hold on security assistance. That was the takeaway. And that's what I referred to repeatedly in the coming weeks whenever it became, became relevant. And I, I'll remind you, uh, uh, Maybe. sir. That, that one more important point. Um, throughout this time, as I've testified, we were trying to find uh, a formula, things we could do with the Ukrainians that would convince the president that they were worth talking to. Maybe, maybe Mr. Holmes, the takeaway was he thought it was no big deal because he already knew. He didn't remember it because we already had the transcript. No, I, he I didn't remember the. He didn't remember the. We, we had the, 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 the Trump Zelensky transcript had been out for two months. Sir, I believe that when Even I. Even though you're repeatedly bringing this conversation up, 
as you said, to everybody when it's when there any time there's a talk about Ukraine, you you recall this conversation. Maybe it was the transcript. The call happened on the July 25th. That's four months ago. The transcript's been out for two months. Maybe the ambassador thought this is this is nothing new here. But Shazam! Last week you come forward with supposed this new information. There is nothing different in there than what we had on the transcript. Maybe that's the reason their star witness, their first witness, didn't bring it up. But they had to have something. So you're their closing witness because you overheard you overheard the president talking to Ambassador Sondland. Sir, if I could answer, I see four seconds left on the clock. Um, I Mr. believe Mr. that Mr. Holmes, you may take as long as you need. Thank you, sir. I believe that Ambassador Taylor did already know when I briefed him when I returned from vacation on the 6th. He, it was not news to him that the president was pressing for a Biden investigation. That's not what I asked. I asked why he didn't share with us. Mr. Well, Jordan, Mr. Jordan, please it, do not interrupt the witness any further. Uh, Mr. Holmes, this, this is exactly Mr. Jordan's my... time has expired, but yours has not. Okay, thank you, You may sir. answer the question. <laughs> uh, it's exactly my point. Um, I briefed the call in detail of the deputy chief of mission, went away for a week, come back, I refer to the call, and everyone is nodding. Of course that's what's going on. Of course the president is pressing for a Biden investigation before he'll do these things the Ukrainians want. There was nodding agreement. So did I go through every single word in the call? No, because everyone by that point agreed. It was obvious what the president was pressing for. And Ambassador Taylor, as you've just outlined, had all those other interactions. With but he all didn't these share it with us. Mr. Jordan, please do not interrupt. But sir, sir, then, <laughs> that, but, but, but sir, my vivid recollection of an event I was involved with was a touchstone experience that to me validated and what, sir, Jordan, finish, please what, please what we interrupt. believed. And Ambassador Taylor was not in that call. And so he all was, of a sudden last week, you've got to come Mr. tell Jordan, us, right? Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan, you will allow the witness to answer the question. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. Thank you. He was involved in a number of other interactions, as you've outlined, that brought him to the same conclusion. It is quite possible that that... But he doesn't share the Mr. one that Mr. the guy Jordan, he worked Mr. Jordan, with. Mr. Jordan, you may... Share Jordan. You may not like the witness's answer, but we no, will hear I, I, it. There wasn't an answer. Mr. Was Jordan, we will hear the witness's answer. Have you concluded, Mr. Holmes? I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Himes. <laughs> uh, pretty heightened interaction right there between Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio and David Holmes trying to explain why he felt that Ambassador Taylor knew about his phone call or the, the phone call that Holmes had overheard with Sondland in the restaurant on the phone with Trump and why he didn't bring it up to him until just a couple of weeks ago because it didn't come to light until last week in Ambassador Taylor's testimony. And that's why they then subpoenaed David Holmes. He then appeared in private last week and now we heard from him today. Jesse, anything there? I mean, obviously that was some fireworks right there between the two of them, but, uh, but you know, the substance of it, um, your thoughts. Sure. What I think was interesting about what we saw today and kind of a direct contrast to what we've seen um, in previous hearings is that you had Sondland and um, Volker explicitly say that they didn't make the connection between Burisma and the Biden investigation until much later. And today you had Holmes and Hill both say that anyone with any sort of knowledge on Ukraine policy, anyone who deals with the country at all would have to to make that connection nearly immediately. Um, and so I wonder if maybe that worried some Republicans who have been trying to discredit all of this, discredit that link, um, and that could have potentially led to what we saw right there too. Yeah, and you know what? Dr. Fiona Hill sort of testified to that, saying that she didn't believe it was credible that Ambassador Sondland didn't know that the that when the president was pushing for Burisma investigations, that that also meant the Bidens, which is what Sondland testified to yesterday, saying he knew that this White House meeting was contingent upon Ukrainians' president announcing this investigation publicly into Burisma, but he said that he didn't think that also meant the Bidens. Uh, Dr. Fiona Hill saying that's not really credible, that it seemed like everybody knew that that was what it was all about. And I'll play this last soundbite here from Dr. Fiona Hill on, on what Sondland was up to at the time. She says that it seemed as though, again, back to this sort of two channels of diplomacy here, that there was the regular channel that she on the National Security Council was working on, Do Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, all the other uh, Foreign Service professionals that you've heard from here, and that 
uh, the, the, this group known as the Three Amigos, Ambassador Gordon Sondland, Ambassador Kurt Volker, and Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, were in this separate channel. And she talked about today how she felt like they were doing official foreign policy for the U.S. and what the other group was doing was more of an errand. He indicated you were upset and you were upset with Ambassador Bolton and upset with the way things are going. And I believe your, your counsel said that was an outright fabrication. Well, I think you might recall in my deposition on October 14th that I said that very unfortunately I had a bit of a blow up uh, with Ambassador Sunderland and I had a couple of testy encounters with him. One of those was in June 18 um, when I actually said to him, who put you in charge of Ukraine? And you know, I'll admit I was a bit rude and that's when he told me the president, which shut me up. And this um, other meeting, um, it was about 15, 20 minutes, exactly as he depicted it was. I was actually, to be honest, angry with him. And, um, um, you know, um, I hate to say it, but often when women show anger, it's not fully appreciated. It's often, you know, pushed onto emotional issues, uh, perhaps, or deflected um, onto um, other people. And what I was angry about was that he wasn't coordinating with us. Now, I actually realized, having listened to his deposition, that he was absolutely right. That he wasn't coordinating with us because we weren't doing the same thing that he was doing. So I was upset with him that he wasn't fully telling us about all of the meetings that he was having. And he said to me, but I'm briefing the president. I'm briefing Chief of Staff Mulvaney. I'm briefing Secretary Pompeo, and I've talked to Ambassador Bolton. Who else do I have to deal with? And the point is we have a robust interagency process uh, that deals with Ukraine. It includes Mr. Holmes. It includes Ambassador Taylor as the charge in Ukraine. It includes a whole load of other people. But it struck me when yesterday, when you put up on the screen Ambassador Sondland's emails and who was on these emails, and he said, these are the people who need to know that he was absolutely right because he was being involved in a domestic political errand. And we were being involved in national security foreign policy, and those two things had just diverged. So he was correct, and I had not put my finger on the, at that at the moment, but I was irritated with him and angry with him that he wasn't fully coordinating. And I did say to him, Ambassador Sondland, Gordon, I think this is all going to blow up, and here we are. And after I left to my next meeting, our director for the European Union talked to him much further for a full half hour or more later, trying to ask him about how we could coordinate better or how others could coordinate better after I had left the office. And his feeling was that the National Security Council was always trying to block him. What we were trying to do was block us from straying into domestic or personal politics. And that was precisely what I was trying to do. But Ambassador Sumbland is not wrong that he had been given a different remit than we had been. And it was at that moment that I started to realize how those things had diverged. And I realized, in fact, that I wasn't really being fair to Ambassador Sondland because he was carrying out what he thought he had been instructed to carry out. And we were doing something that we thought was just as, um, or perhaps even more important, but it wasn't in the same channel. Yeah. Feel really lucky to have watched all of these impeachment hearings because they are quite historic and they're so dense. There's so much information. And just in what she said there, there's so much to break down. Her comments on women not being taken seriously when they show anger. She made a couple of references, actually, to the things that women go through when they are in prominent positions of power, rep making reference to Ambassador Yovanovitch and especially to, uh, to uh, Representative Elise Stefanik, even, who was, who was asking some questions. And she's been taking some heat publicly because that's what happens when you're a woman and you're in public. Uh, Jesse, I'll leave it up to you whether you want to address any of those things that, that she talked about about, but I am interested in getting your opinion on what she said right there, because she, uh, or your analysis, I, I should say, of what she said right there, because she was talking about how she had an argument with Gordon Sondland because he seemed to be pursuing something else than, than what she was pursuing on the National Security Council and what, and what the rest of the Ukraine team was pursuing, and that she got very angry with him and then realized after she watched his testimony quite closely, she said multiple times today, that he was pursuing what he had been given the directive to do. The difference was, and the problem was, that she and the rest of the NSC and the rest of the Ukraine team weren't in that loop. They didn't know about it, and that's why they felt like they were being left out, and she got very angry about that with him, Jesse. 
Yeah, I think this was the moment that was the biggest takeaway from her testimony. Um, we, you know, just kind of hearing her talk about that, she probably in all of these hearings these past two weeks broke down the confusion uh, maybe the best. So this would be like you're, you're at work, you and you know one of your colleagues, you work on a, a certain team for a common goal, but then you see your colleague you know, potentially going to different meetings or not telling you um, everything that's going on, but you're supposed to be working as this unit. And so you finally confront this person and say, what's going on? Who's giving you this directive? And that person tells you our boss. It's kind of hard, like she said, to negate any of that. She, she even said herself that shut her up pretty quickly about her concerns. She went in pretty mad and then she was you know, just kind of left it being, well, what can I do about that? And so, um, again, like she said, that's when really the confusion started for her and she finally saw that there were these different channels. But Republicans were still quick, though, to ask Hill and Holmes, you know, when it comes to foreign policy, aren't there, you know, irregular channels that uh, former administrations have taken at times, too, just to get things done for the U.S. And they said, certainly, but I think um, they were just able to have a feeling and point to other circumstance, circumstantial evidence that they had, um, that they thought they had to say that this this was different and these two channels that were operating on different wavelengths, it, it something about it wasn't right. Great synopsis, Jesse. That's exactly right. And, and I thought you're also right in saying that Hill was really the first person who very lucidly spoke through the confusion and kind of wrapped up these issues that have been floating around that you're hearing about that keep coming up in these hearings. And she was so excellent at just giving the historical perspective and also why it mattered and what the impact was of the things that were happening at the time. She was an excellent witness. I can say, I, you know, and, and I'm I guess I'm, you know, stepping out of uh, of a role of analysis right here and and being a fan for a second. But I can say that uh, I am certainly even more of a fan of the United States and our foreign policy apparatus after watching these individuals testify. Because again, they're all nonpartisan people who are professionals doing their jobs. And I think if you watched these hearings or watched a lot of these, I think regardless of how you feel about the political impacts of what's happening, if you can see through that for a second and just look at the people who we have working for us in embassies and, and foreign posts around the world it makes you proud to be an American, really, because those people are really amazing. And uh, the way that they put their lives on the line and also bring the expertise that they do every day, it really, it, it, it's shown through. And I, I think that, that that's one positive that I think is a bipartisan positive that you can take away from these impeachment hearings, which is our foreign service officials are quite amazing. Yeah, and compelling, too, that we have Fiona Hill uh, joining us from the UK. Uh, that was uh, also a really interesting thing. And very clear that she is American and her loyalty right. is here. And that she made that very, very clear over the course That's of definitely. the proceedings. Um, and, and that was highly talked about on Twitter. I saw a lot of people tweeting about how, uh, how loyal she seemed to the United States and to the United States and their agenda abroad and how this is, again, a woman who has dedicated you know, her adult life to representing the United States uh, in international affairs. I yeah, I actually want to have a quick, before we go back to the to poll on that, JB, I sure. want to point out just real quick, because I lived abroad for about five or six years in the UK, actually, and she's she's so right, because there, hit, there comes a certain point where you have to decide where your loyalties lie. And I was at that point, I could have applied for a UK passport, lived there, become a dual citizen, but my home was here, and my heart was here, and I wanted to return to the US. She made the opposite choice, and decided she was going to stay in the US, and become an American citizen, a naturalized citizen, and I think the country is better for it. So it's uh, it was pretty amazing to hear her story, and certainly the stories of other, uh, other officials that we heard from, including Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, Hale, all of them, Ambassador Yovanovitch, very impressive people. All right, guys, our poll results are uh, fascinating to say the least. Um, and here's the question. This is what we asked, and, and uh, a reminder that we are here at WFLA. We're here in the Tampa Bay region of Florida, the I-4 corridor we talk about quite a bit here, Evan, and uh, our polls are blasted out primarily to folks in that region of the country mm -hmm. just because that's where the origin of this stream is. So keep that into context and also into context that this is an unscientific Facebook poll, not really scientific, but still the results are interesting in that 
we were just kind of taking the temperature as to how people are feeling out there. So you can read into it what you will. But the question was, week two of impeachment hearings are over. Do you support the proceedings to impeach President Trump? Three answers. Yes, no, or no answer. We, we gave you that third option there. If you preferred not to answer that question in our interactive poll, here are your results. 33% say yes. I support the proceedings to impeach the president. 62% say no. 5% undecided or no answer. And the reason why these results are so fascinating, Evan, is that we have run so many polls previously to this, and it's usually somewhere in the range of a 40-40 split, and then about somewhere 10, oh, 10 or so that would prefer not to answer. So hmm. low 40s on each side, and then 10% that, re, you know, that refuse to answer. But now we have a lot of folks out there, at least in this unscientific Facebook poll, 62%, nearly two thirds of poll respondents saying no, they do not support the proceedings to impeach President Trump. And I, I, I tried to find a quote here that kind of encapsulated our poll results that we had. And uh, this is an interesting one from outgoing uh, Congressman Will Hurd, the representative, the Republican from Texas. And I want to read his exact words here for you because uh, uh, he used his time to make this point and emphasize this point very carefully. He said, quote, an impeachable offense should be compelling, overwhelmingly clear and unambiguous and it's not something to be rushed or taken lightly. I have not heard evidence proving the president committed bribery or extortion, end quote. So that's the quote there from Representative Will Hurd. I wonder if the American people feel the same way after seeing two weeks here of testimony from Capitol Hill, but I'll leave that to you, Evan, and you, Jesse. A couple things to, to talk about there. Representative Will Hurd of Texas has announced that he is not running for re-election and is way known out. very much as a straight shooter and, and you know, kind of respected uh, by both sides. He sort of tells it like it is, former military guy. You hear him a lot if you watch these impeachment hearings saying good copy all the time. You know, he's a, he's a military guy. He's very proud of that uh, and, again, is, is pretty well respected. So I thought that part of his... I guess you could consider closing statement. It was technically his five minutes for questions, but really he was just making a statement. Right, it was closing statements for a lot of the committee yeah. members. And this, I thought this was their last chance, really, for what we know right now, because there's nothing else on the possibly, schedule. Possibly, yeah. Possibly this was their closing statement for this stage of the impeachment hearing. And I thought that was powerful, and more powerful coming from him, knowing that I think people who are in the know uh, know that he's a straight shooter and that he wasn't going to be just entirely partisan. And it could, be, it could so, be his last moment, really, in the national spotlight in that magnitude. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, very interesting there. The poll results also interesting. We heard from a Trump campaign official, excuse me, I apologize, an RNC official, yep. Republican National Committee official that we spoke to earlier today on this stream who said the same thing, said that she was seeing some internal polling that showed that Americans were, uh, weren't were so much split anymore that they were starting to favor uh, n not impeaching the president. And so that is a little bit of a shift, and we saw a little bit of that in our extremely unscientific Facebook poll here. Uh, Jesse, we're certainly not uh, claiming that this is that this is anything that is a bellwether for America, right. but certainly it's just great to get your opinion, folks. And again, we encourage you to follow us on social media. I'm at Evan Donovan on Twitter all the time. Uh, you can follow Jesse. I'll let her uh, give her give you her final thoughts as well as her social media accounts, and then JB as well. But let me go to you, Jesse, for some final thoughts as we look to wrap up here on day three of week two of these impeachment hearings. Yeah, I think it's really important to just include what people are thinking, because going into this, um, when we were on the Hill asking members of the House, I, one of the questions that I asked them specifically was, do you think these proceedings will change the minds of the American people one way or another, or are their minds already made up? I talked to 40 plus congressmen and women, and I think two of them said that it could potentially change people's minds. So for the most part, people's minds are already made up. And I think kind of dragging along this process and really getting into the minutia of a lot of this foreign policy is potentially, you know, kind of glossing over people to the point where you would almost expect a result like the one that you got in that unofficial poll. But I think that's really interesting. And so we'll have to see what happens next. I know we keep saying that it's likely the House will send those articles of impeachment to the Senate. And then right now, the Senate, it's not looking like it has the votes. But I did just want to say that once, if it would get to the Senate, the Senate can make its own rules. So something that we've been talking about today is, is there an open or a closed vote? 
and we'll have to see what the Senate does about that. But if it was a closed vote, uh, meaning that the names wouldn't appear, it would, you wouldn't be able to see who voted for what, that we could see uh, some changes there, and there could be a different outcome as far as the fate of the president. But again, that remains to be seen. But definitely the end of two very historic weeks in Washington that I hope a lot of people tuned into and you at least gleaned some in new information, even if it didn't completely change your mind. Because again, I think it was really important. And yeah, to just continue um, on what you guys have been doing too, feel free to follow me too on Twitter at Jesse Tenor, and we'll be bringing you the latest from Washington as all this keeps going. Really appreciate you joining us, Jesse. Some uh, fantastic analysis there. Tenor, a little bit hard to spell, so on your screen there, folks, look at that. <laughs> uh, Jesse with an I, and Tenor is her last name. Follow her on Twitter. Follow me as well, at Evan Donovan. JB, your final thoughts before uh, before we say goodbye. Yeah, just it, it's been fascinating to watch all of this happen in, in real time. Twitter was really not even just secondary to these proceedings, but you heard there in the first week as Marie Ivanovich was testifying, you heard the president's attack on Twitter come out against her and then them stop the line of questioning to have Marie Ivanovich, the former ambassador, get, give her a chance on the national cha uh, stage to respond. For me, uh, following social media so closely here and being the digital part of these streams or, or the one conveying digital information to people out there to take the pulse as to what's happening. It's been fascinating to watch this unfold real time on Twitter. Uh, even the president of the United States tweeting out his thoughts as the proceedings for his own impeachment is going on in real time. It's been fascinating. The year is 2019. The technology has really made an impact on these proceedings, and it's been fascinating to watch. And, yeah, feel free to follow me on Twitter, on social media as well, WFLAJB. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch, and it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, how things develop going forward. It's been a pleasure to work with both of you. I've had a good time uh, chatting, and really this has been highly educational for all of us, I think, and it's been a pleasure to work with the entire Next Star team here on this broadcast over the last week plus. Same to you, JB. My final thoughts for you folks as we close up here on our Next Star live digital broadcast of the impeachment hearings of Donald Trump. Really, mine is very nonpartisan. You have to watch what happened here over the past couple of weeks and view it through a nonpartisan lens to find out how you think about it. Don't let other people do your thinking for you. There's a couple steps that I think everyone should take. Number one, read the transcript of the phone call, okay? There you get the president's own words, both presidents from the United States and from the Ukraine. You've also heard our breakdown and analysis here of what's happened. You can go back. Look at what you uh, look at this on Facebook. You can see these broadcasts on Facebook and go back and watch some critical testimony if you want to. But the biggest thing is get involved. If you believe or don't believe that the president should be impeached, call your congressman, talk to your representative, tell that person how you feel and make sure that you get involved. Also call your senators, because if this impeachment goes through and it goes to the Senate, then they will want to know what their constituents think. So always be involved by talking to your representatives and your senators. That is the biggest piece of advice I can give you. And of course, a shameless plug here for 2020. Get out, register, and vote. That is the most important thing that you can do in this democracy. And I think what's so crucial about what we saw here was hearing about Ukraine, a fledgling democracy, mm -hmm. a country that wants to be like us, people who want to be free of corruption, to not have to deal with those types of things. We are lucky to live in this country, so take advantage of it. Make sure you use your right to vote and talk to the representatives whom you elected, whether you voted or not. They're still your representatives. Talk to them and tell them how you feel. That's what makes this country great. And I guess with that, we will begin here to say goodbye. Jesse Tunur from our D.C. Bureau, thank you so much for joining us. J.B. Buno, our digital anchor here. Evan Donovan, political anchor for Next Star. Thank you so much for watching our live digital broadcast of the impeachment hearings. If and when there are more hearings, we will certainly let you know about it, and we will be back here to bring you more analysis. And we say goodbye. Farewell, everybody.